Dear colleagues, let me make one announcement first. You are right in this room if you expect a debate and enlightening presentations about new forms of warfare and armed conflict. You unfortunately have to move to another room, contrary to what is indicated on the program, if you want to enjoy Agora 4, dealing with the question, is international law on state immunity in crisis? This Agora will take place in Diana Hall, and I was told it is located downstairs. So I perhaps wait for a second to see to whom that concern. But I don't see terribly much movement. In that case, let me very warmly welcome all of you to our Agora 1 on new forms of warfare and armed conflict. We have all been enjoying wonderful conversations this morning. I found beautifully setting the scene for what is to follow. And I believe the ground has been beautifully set now to start uh, looking into more concrete issues. And the, the issues that we will be looking at, while fairly diverse, will all somehow deal with very current problems, challenges uh, of the law of armed conflict, rather than the use ad bellum, or as I would prefer to call it, the use contra bellum. May I introduce our four presentations, and I do this in the sequence of their presentations, starting with my immediate neighbor, Eyal Gross, who will share with us his perspective on the law of occupation. He will acquaint us with a term that at least I was not so much familiar with before, a jus ad occupationem and other interesting issues. Ayal is a professor uh, teaching at Tel Aviv University, and he has completed uh, writing the manuscript of a book entitled, very much fitting to this panel, Writing on the Wall, Rethinking the Law of Occupation. And this book is due to appear, I understand, later this year. Then uh, we continue with um, Helene Heufeld, who will talk about the legal status and the legal intricacies surrounding that status of returning foreign fighters. This will um, involve us in reflections about what has come to be called by many transnational armed, non-international armed conflict, armed conflicts, and also with certain interesting passages in more recent resolutions by the Security Council. Helene is a PhD fellow at Aarhus University and a guest researcher at the Asser Institute and the Norwegian Institute for Human Rights. Next to her, Mr. Asaf Lubin, who will deal with an issue that is very often touched upon by both politicians, critics, and also scholars, but rarely reflected upon in depth, even though I would consider this as one of the most uh, deserving issues of a more uh, deep scholarly scrutiny. That's the role intelligence plays uh, in the law of armed conflict and, of course, in its conduct of hostility parts more in particular. Asaf is a JSD candidate 
at Yale Law School. He is the resident fellow of the school's Information Society project, and he is the Robert Lee Bernstein International Human Rights Fellow with Privacy International. Last, but certainly not least, Oslem Ulgen, who will share her reflections with us on autonomous weapons, but not just broadly, but from one specific perspective at the borderline between law and ethics, how the principle, the idea of human dignity relates uh, to this um, new and highly problematic device recently much under consideration. Oslem is a senior lecturer at Birmingham City University and thinking about the ethical and legal implications of the use of autonomous weapons uh, is one of her current uh, key areas of research. All four, um, perhaps I should say last and least, um, my name is Klaus Kress, teaching public international law and criminal law in the University of Cologne. All four um, panelists have been extremely generous in that they have um, accepted my invitation to keep their presentations fairly short and condensed. That's quite a challenge. I'm perfectly aware of it with such uh, difficult issues. After a significant amount of mathematical deliberations, we have come to the conclusion that broadly 12 minutes uh, could be fine. We have done so in the expectation to speak before a very distinguished audience which will have a flood of questions afterward and will be more than happy to open and engage uh, in a debate. So please um, meet that expectations knowing that they have cut their presentation short. They could have spoken. I'm, I had the privilege of reading their entire papers. They could have spoken each for one hour and a half on their own. With this, and following our um, self-said project, to cut it short, without further ado, Ayal, you have the floor. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's a bit daunting to speak in such a big room. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I, uh, uh, you, you did not uh, hear Klaus hear this term before because actually when I was writing the introduction to the book, I came up with this term actually. Uh, so it's, it's the first time it's being presented in a conference because I, some of my uh, work and occupations that the book uh, uh, draws upon uh, was presented in previous conferences, including the European Society, but uh, not the whole picture. Uh, and now I have this daunting task to do some of the whole picture, at least in 12 minutes. Uh, so, so yeah, so actually when I uh, uh, was writing the introduction for the book and I was hoping the book would be ready by the conference, but as things happen, you know, it's always like that. It's always a bit later than you think, but by the next conference it will be out and even before. So um, uh, as I was uh, writing the introduction, I was thinking more and more that actually what a big part of what I was trying to do or what I was looking at me and, and, of, and, and other colleagues over the years, it's, it's, it's in a way, maybe we did this, this distinction. Uh, uh, and the reason I, I like we're familiar in use in bellum and use ad bellum, uh, or use contra bellum, uh, good idea. So, um, and the reason I uh, uh, use this term is in a way uh, because uh, um, I think traditionally people many times treated occupation as just a factual situation to which norms apply. Uh, and, and, and actually, uh, here are two statements from two people very involved in two very big occupation, important occupation. The first one, Meir Shamgar, he was um, the attorney general during the Israeli occupation in 67. Uh, actually, no, he was a judge advocate general in 67 and later attorney general. 
and later president of the Israeli Supreme Court. So I think he is the one person that more than anyone else was the architect of the legal regime of the Israeli occupation in the occupied Palestinian territory. And he said, uh, you know, uh, occupation is a factual situation and the pending a solution, it's a system of government that could, from a legal point of view, continue indefinitely. So it's a factual situation that exists because some territory was occupied in war. Of course, there are rules that apply to how it should be run, the rules in Hague and Geneva, but it's a factual situation. And in a way, similarly, Paul Bremer, who was the head of the coalition provisional authority in Iraq, said occupation is an ugly word, not one Americans feel comfortable with, but it is a fact. So against this uh, approach to occupation is just a fact, uh, actually going back to uh, um, uh, uh, the first ISIL conference in Florence, <laughs> the first one I presented together with my colleague Orda Benaftali, the article we authored together with, both of us together with uh, Karen Michaeli, uh, where we tried to say occupation is not just a factual situation, it's also an, a normative thing and actually, uh, we introduced then the idea of illegal occupation not because of the use of force that is relating to the occupation or not, but because of the way whether, whether the occupation is actually really managed like an occupation. And we identified uh, three principles that derive from the Hague Regulation, the Geneva Convention, uh, from general principles of international law, uh, that occupation... Uh, um, uh, does not confer title, right, rights are not vested, uh, they do, do not go to the occupying power. We all know this. Occupying power is entrusted with the management of public order and civil life. So it's a form of trust where you manage something which is not yours. And occupation is temporary and it cannot be permanent or indefinite because if it is, there is nothing to distinguish it from conquest or from old forms of colonialism. And I think here we can say there can be a benign reading of the law of occupation, saying, unlike the old co conquest and colonialism, occupation is a regime that you c control a territory on a temporary basis because you occupied it in war and you manage it to the benefit of the local population. But there can be another reading saying, occupation is a new regime which under the, uh, you know, this uh, cloak of tempora, uh, being temporary is a new form of colonialism, it's a new fo but which now get legitimacy. So, colonialism and apartheid uh, in conquest are all illegal, but you can control a territory supposedly forever and say it's occupation. Occupation by, by such is just a fact that can continue forever. So we wanted to say no, occupation has normative content, and if it doesn't really fulfill those conditions, it's not really anymore a legal occupation. It's an illegal occupation. Now, so this is uh, something we've done before, and. Um, and, and currently, uh, I, what I want to talk to you about is continue that work. Um, and, and, and again, you can see the question, how does occupation not become new forms of colonialism, conquest to apartheid? But there's another question that came up, uh, and, and that really is discussed in the book quite extensively. Uh, when we wrote this article, we said those are the purposes of occupation, the legitimate purposes. But actually, the more I was thinking about it, I was thinking, yeah, but in reality, most countries that occupy territory, they have other interests. They don't just want to occupy it, to control it for a short time and go back. They occupy it because they have a political, a territorial, national, religious, economic, security or perceived security interest. And they want to control the territory for those purposes. And this is true with both occupations I already mentioned, the US in Iraq and, uh, and the Israeli one is the occupied Palestinian territory, where there are all sort of national, political, very different interests involved. So, a question is how to re reconcile uh, the conflicting goals um, uh, of those states um, with what the law of occupation allows. And I do not have the time to go into this here in depth, but I want to say that uh, the transform I suggest that we reread the transformative occupation debate as a debate about this conflict between the law of occupation and between other purposes that states have. And think that not only Iraq is transformative occupation, Occupied Palestinian territory is also transformative occupation, not, you know, uh, uh, sometimes very, det usually very detrimental to the uh, Palestinian uh, residents, but sometimes the argument were made not very, not very different than Iraq, that it is actually for the benefit. So all sorts of ro roads were built, 
taxes were imposed, and it was said this is for the benefit of the local population. So this was usually not discussed in the transformative occupation debate, but I suggest we look at this and we see how the transformative occupation debate allows sometimes, even when the term is used or when it's not used, to deviate from the basic principles in order to promote the interest of the occupying parties, and, uh, which, uh, and, and, and that can actually be part of what will make an occupation illegal if it doesn't fulfill those conditions, and we must insist on this concept of illegal occupation because otherwise occupation will become a legitimizing uh, legal institution for new forms of conquest, colonialism, apartheid, etc. So uh, uh, I'm skipping this. I'll go back here for a moment. Uh, so why is it used at, bell, used at occupation? Because it does not talk about how we act in occupation. Yeah, in occupation, under Article 50 of Geneva, we must care for education. Under Article 49 of Geneva, we cannot deport people. Under um, uh, certain articles of Hague, we can take property or not take property. All of this is used in occupation. But the question, is it a legal occupation at all? Is it an occupation? Is use at occupation? And, 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 but the question about the use at occupation is not only whether it's a legal occupation, but is it at all occupation? And here we have seen a lot, of a lot of debates in recent years, especially after Iraq in 2004 and after Gaza in 2005. You are familiar with it. Is it still occupied or not? And, um, and, it, it, and uh, uh, one day, I, one of those conferences I was sitting and I was hearing people, do you need boots on the ground? Or do you not need boots on the ground? Do you? And I was thinking I was to, to determine if it's occupation. And I felt like, uh, 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 recall the famous article by American legal realist Felix Cohen when he talked about transcendental nonsense of, heavenly, of heaven of legal concepts. And he said, all those concepts, is it contract or not? Is it property or not? You end up the circular discussion which forgets that you have to ask what is the purpose of the law. And his suggestion was, you know, we need a functional approach rather this conceptualism that we have to classify is it contract or not. And I started thinking more about this regarding occupation. I started thinking the debate, is Gaza occupied or not, with people arguing do you need boots on the ground or not, has nothing to do with the reality of daily life of people in the occupied territory and with the purpose of protecting them. And, and that's where I started thinking, you know, on the functional approach, which the ICRC recently adopted without credit, but that's okay. And, and, um, and actually in my work in the NGO Gisha, uh, which is an Israeli NGO deal with Gaza, we talked about it, started talking about it in our reports shortly after the disengagement. And, and uh, there was even a debate in Opinio Juris about this following something I wrote. And, and, um, and so started thinking it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be an all or nothing um, very question, but also starting to think how the normative and the functional approach as com complementary and needed one another as used ad bellum. Because for example, they will tell you regarding Gaza, it's a normative thing and a functional thing to understand that Israel continued to exercise a lot of power over Gaza, even if there is no permanent military presence in the territory. So, uh, and you have to functionally see when does it have duties of occupier and when does it not. And you have to understand normatively that you can't just say, I don't have any more duties because I stopped my permanent military presence if you do not allow the local population to exercise self-determination uh, in, in the full and substantive form. And I think we can already see that some of the case law, without calling it in this name, started to go in this direction. Uh, you tell me when I have five minutes, yeah? So uh, unlike the five now, Okay, unlike the, if you go back to 1945, the famous uh, hostages case uh, uh, from the military tribunal in Nuremberg. So there the, the military court said the occupant's power is as great as his responsibility as occupier. So if you are considered an occupier, yes or not, your responsibility is as big as your powers, the powers that international law gives you. But if you look at the Ethiopia Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia Eritrea Claims uh, Commission from 2005, then the tribunal says, uh, because there's a question where an army was present in a territory over, only for a short time, so did it have the full duty of an occupier? And the tribunal says, well, the responsibility of an occupier is as great as its power, which is the opposite answer. And I think that's a functional answer. And actually, even the Israeli Supreme Court in a one, some of the Gaza cases I was not happy with the outcome, but actually said there could be responsibilities from the continuing power that Israel has um, um, 
uh, over Gaza. So I think uh, that we have to get out here from the on-off approach, from the binary approach. Oppenheim famously said that occupation does not give even one atom of sovereignty, but as Schwarzenberger said, it's really occupation makes sovereignty a naked title. But what happens when sovereignty is exercised partly? You have a Palestinian authority, you have a Hamas regime, they exercise some powers, but very limited powers. Uh, on the other hand, the occupation is partial. There is no permanent military force in, of Israel in Gaza, but on the other hand, Israel cont controls the, most of the external perimeter, perimeter. It controls the airspace, the waterways. What happens then? How to create accountability and not to create a pick and choose regime? Um, and, and I think that um, uh, this is necessary, uh, and again, I will continue with the example of the Israeli occupied Palestinian Israeli uh, occupied territories of the Palestinians, it's not only in the Gaza, also in the West Bank, you see move to control with less friction. You see it with the establishment of Palestinian Authority. We see it with the wall. Definitely you see it in Gaza. And uh, so you have to think about the changing nature of control because of political and technological changes. So Adam Roberts, once wrote, there is not much worrying about whether occupation exists. As long as there is face-to-face -face interaction between the occupying army and the population, there is occupation. But what happens when the whole occupation becomes uh, trying to avoid face-to-face -face interaction? Think of the wall. Think of the fact that in the West Bank, Israel has now uh, privatized much of the checkpoints to prevent face-to-face -face interaction between the army and the occupied population, to make them look like civilian terminals. Think, of course, the Gaza disengagement, when actually so much of the daily life of Gazans is controlled by Israel, but in a way that avoids face-to-face -face interaction, but allows you to bomb from the air, and etc. So uh, now, some people uh, who try to advocate for Palestinian rights said, we must insist Israel is the occupier, and I totally sympathize with that. But then, for example, when you had the hostilities between Fatah and Hamas, that would mean Israel has not only the right, but even the duty to enter and restore order, etc. So you actually, you have to remember, when you say someone is occupier, you also give them more force. Is this a desirable result that Israel would have to enter and use its force to restore security when there are hostilities between Fatah and Hamas? Uh, not clear to me at all, because actually, Israel doesn't really, doesn't have permanent military presence there. On the other hand, to the extent that the control that Israel does have of the external perimeter, has affects uh, food security, for example, because that's a topic I've written a separate article on, or affects education, or affects other issues, you do have the responsibility of an occupier, and not just the responsibilities coming from general law of belligerency. And again, in my work on food security uh, with Tamar Feldman, we saw very closely how the responsibility of an occupier would be different than the general responsibilities under IHL, and how um, the fact that you have so much control of the external perimeter affects food security in Gaza, and you should thus have the heightened duties of an occupier. How are we doing the time? Have to finish? Okay. So, um, as I'm saying, uh, you know, I, I won't go uh, in this talk into um, the question of the youth in occupation that the book also deals with. Um, uh, I just say that, I, again, the, I think the functional and the normative approach together are needed as a new use at occupation that will help us answer the question of is there a situation of occupation, but the answer doesn't have to be yes or no, it's much more complex, there could be a functional approach which is not binary, and help us answer the question, is this a legal occupation, or is this an occupation? It is an occupation, but it is an illegal one, which should not be allowed to continue and be considered a legal regime, because it's not just a fact. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm here to discuss with you today, hopefully, uh, which legal regimes that applies to foreign fighters in two situations. Um, the one situation is a person who travels from one state to another state to take part in armed conflict. For example, this guy. This is uh, Rajid Khan. He was uh, a British citizen who chose to become a member of ISIL and travel to Syria to take part in the armed conflict. 
He was killed by uh, British Air Forces uh, last year on the grounds that he constituted a threat to the British society upon return. Now, this raises a number of questions which I would love to discuss with you. Um, amongst others, which legal regimes applies to individuals who uh, take part in armed conflict against their own state on another state's territory? Meaning, are European citizens, in this case, continued to be protected under the European Convention of Human Rights against the state after having traveled outside that state's territory? And if so, uh, shall the right to life under the European Convention of Human Rights be interpreted in accordance with the principles under international humanitarian law? Though I am very interested in what you think about this, uh, what I will be focusing on in my 10 minutes is this situation. So imagining that Rajid Khan had not been killed by the British forces, but he had instead uh, traveled home to London, uh, he might um, have uh, planned an attack in London. Uh, he could have helped plan an attack in Syria, or perhaps he just returned home to visit his sick mom, but planned to return to Syria the week after. Uh, meaning he had a continuous, uh, he continuously took part in the armed conflict in Syria. And my question is then, is he still covered by international humanitarian law, even though he has moved himself out of the area in which the main hostilities take place? Another situation which I will not go into is, of course, the person who never leaves his home country, but takes part in the armed conflict via the internet or telephone or in any way uh, is uh, taking part in the conflict. And the fourth situation, which I will not discuss either, is the situation in which he travels to a third state. And I think there's enough debate on whether international humanitarian law applies in a third country without me having to go into that. So, first of all, what we need to find out is whether international humanitarian law actually applies outside the territory in which the main hostilities takes place. And I think we can all agree that it definitely applies in the whole territory of the state uh, in which the conflict originated and that the hostilities may also spread and spill over into any neighboring states. As I said, I don't really want to discuss this situation where he travels to a third state because that is uh, very, very uh, complicated, I find. But I will discuss this situation because the difference from this situation where he travels to a state that is actually a party to the conflict is that international humanitarian law does not apply on the basis of his uh, status as a participant, but it applies uh, because uh, international humanitarian law is equally applicable in the territory of all parties to the conflict. So accepting that humanitarian law is applicable in the whole uh, territory of the state in which the main hostilities takes place and arguing that a conflict remains non-international when several states take part extraterritorially we also have to accept that the application of humanitarian law does not depend on a continuous local level of violence um, and that common article 3 is applicable uh, in all territories of the parties. So, if we assume that international humanitarian law is actually applicable um, in the home state, uh, if that state is party to the conflict, then of course it raises questions um, on how the international humanitarian law interact with those other legal regimes that apply um, in the home state. And of course the obvious um, issue is with the human rights law and 
Just to mention this briefly, you may comment on this as well, but I will just go quickly through it. The uh, European Court of Human Rights has had some cases where they have applied uh, standards from international humanitarian law in situations of counterinsurgency and evolving heavy fighting, and it seems to distinguish between those who take part and those who don't take part in hostilities. But it also seems to apply the human rights standards uh, in a situation of uh, armed conflict when the state is in control of that territory. So once the state has control of that area again, then uh, the human rights standards will apply. And that's, of course, based on the fact that, well, human, uh, humanitarian law is the exception. It only applies when uh, the, the local authorities are not able to, um, to prevent an attack by, by, the, by the human rights standards. Yeah. So, the other thing that we have to look at when we are in the home state is the relationship with the counter-terrorist regime. And I say counter-terrorist regime, and I would like to hear your opinion on whether we can actually say that it is a new regime next to the human rights law and the inter uh, international humanitarian law. Because what I argue is that as states generally don't derogate from their human rights obligations, counter-terrorist legislation kind of moves into that space and allows the state to act as if it is within an exception without having to point to one. So, for example, the recently adopted <clears throat> UN Security Council Resolution 2178 on foreign terrorist fighters obligates all states to implement legislation to counter individuals who travel to a state other than their states of residence or nationality for the purpose of perpetrating, planning, or preparation of, or participation in terrorist acts or the providing or receiving of terrorist training including in connection with armed conflict. Meaning, while moving through the ordinary law of the state, this resolution provides the state with, with, with tools that require restrictive interpretation of the European Convention of Human Rights, resulting in restraints of, on liberty, and at the same time, it allows the state not to recognize participants in armed conflict as such, but create this third category of terrorists which has not been defied, defined under international law. So let me give you a few examples on the consequences of this. This is Castello, which is a military base in the center of Copenhagen. And let's imagine that during the international armed conflict in uh, Libya, which Denmark was a party to, a Libyan general travels to Copenhagen, he checks into a hotel, he changes to his uniform, and he takes the bus to Østerport, walks a few meters to Castella, and blows the place up. Now, he only kills soldiers, perhaps one cleaning lady, but as he is a participant in an international armed conflict on behalf of a state, he uh, is a combatant and he has immunity. He cannot be prosecuted, he's not a criminal. He will be detained until the conflict is over and then he'll be sent back to Libya. Had this been today, but the exact same situation, only soldiers die, but this is not a Libyan general, it's a high-ranking member of a non-state armed group in Syria, uh, he would have been charged with terrorism. The only problem is that sometimes we support these terrorists. So this is American soldiers with, if you look at the arm, you have this arm patch which says UPG, UPG which is a, a armed force, a Kurdish armed force, that has close ties to the PKK, which is considered terrorists under the uh, European, uh, uh, the EU, under the EU and, and, and by Turkey and, and several uh, actors. Turkey considers these people as, as terrorists. Americans don't, apparently. 
So what I'm thinking is that are we witnessing some kind of third uh, legal regime next to uh, the human rights? Because as a member of an armed force taking part in a non-international armed conflict, you don't have immunity under international humanitarian law, and you can be prosecuted under domestic law. However, international counterterrorism uh, instruments was originally uh, aimed at peacetime situations and therefore specifically exempted armed forces taking part in armed conflict. The UN Security Council Resolution 2178 specifically applies in armed conflict. And of course, depending on the definition of terrorism, um, in each jurisdiction, the mere participation in armed conflict can constitute a terrorist act under the resolution. So that way you could say that the resolution places itself in the kissing point between the human rights regime and the conduct of hostilities regime, overlapping both regimes um, rather than looking at it as part of law enforcement uh, resting on the human rights regime. Thank you. Um, let me first thank uh, the organizers, ASO, uh, Professor Kress. Um, I feel honored and humbled being here, completely unworthy. Um, and um, what I'm going to try to talk to you about today is an issue that is uh, really important to me uh, and that I've been struggling with um, for the last 10 years. Um, and what Kress has said at, the, at his opening remarks, I think, hit home straight away. Uh, much of our international relations revolve around intelligence analysis uh, and collection, from the U-2 spy planes that uncovered the Soviet missile sites in Cuba to modern-day Iranian exiled dissidents claiming evidence of hidden nuclear facilities in Tehran. Our international relations are governed by intelligence collection. And much like international relations, our international legal order is also dependent upon the elusive estimations of intelligence bureaus. Intercepted transmissions are used to determine the imminency of a threat under use ad bellum. And strategic reconnaissance might serve as a vital tool in making military proportionality assessments under use in bellow. Double agents and geospatial imagery become key evidence in managing well-functioning international financial sanctions regimes or in attributing state responsibility for wrongful acts or even in assigning individual criminal liability for international crimes. Intelligence plays such a cardinal role in the way our world operates that one would have presumed there to be well-established rules of international law undergirded by a vibrant academic and jurisprudential discourse that would govern us on the ways that states might compile, analyze, verify, and promulgate intelligence. However, as uh, Professor Chesterman had said, intelligence exists in a legal penumbra, lying at the margins of diverse legal regimes and at the edge of international legitimacy. And for me, the topic that I'm going to talk to you about, which is just IHL and intelligence, is part of a broader discourse that is lacking about the role intelligence and the function of intelligence plays in our public world order. But I will focus just on IHL. Um, and this penumbra that Professor Chesterman had talked about really exists in IHL to a great extent. Both the Hague Regulations of 1899 and 1907 and, for example, solidify the notion that every method necessary to obtain information about the enemy and country is ipso facto permissible. Countries do not only enjoy this rather explicit sovereign right to spy in war, which I coined in the paper, the USAD Explosion, I already apologize that we're having multiple new kind of legal definitions on the panel. Uh, they are, in fact, obliged to spy, as Pictet himself noted in the authoritative commentary to AP1, and in relation to aerial strike, he said, in the case of long-distance dist strikes, intelligence is, quote, expected to be obtained from aerial reconnaissance and from intelligence units, which will, of course, attempt to gather information about the enemy military objectives by various means. What those means might be are also well explained within the Geneva Conventions, within a body of rules that I call the use in Exploratione. For example, whether a belligerent may collect a visual intelligence using a balloon or human intelligence by pressuring a POW is answered in the Geneva Conventions. Whether a belligerent may collect intelligence during an armistice or transfer the intelligence relying on the ports and waters of a neutral state is also defined in the Geneva Conventions. Whether you can torture to obtain information or misuse a flag or truce to obtain information is also defined in the Geneva Conventions. But you see, the buck stops there.
while creating detailed rules on the way intelligence are to be collected in war, IHL omits principles concerning the other parts of the entire intelligence cycle, namely how the intelligence that was collected is to be now analyzed, verified, and promulgated into operational orders for attack. In fact, all that we are told is that military commanders must do, quote, everything feasible, unquote, to properly identify their targets with a view to avoiding, and in any event, to minimizing incidental loss of civilian life. The expert committee established by the prosecutor of the ICTY to review the 1999 NATO bombing campaign clarified this obligation ever so slightly. They noted that a military commander must set up, quote, an effective intelligence gathering system to collect and evaluate information concerning potential targets. They also noted, however, that the same military commander has a range of discretion to determine which available resources shall be used and just how they shall be used. We are thus left wondering what constitutes sufficient intelligence for launching an aerial, an aerial strike. This question is currently left unanswered by the current law, Lex Lata leaving vast margin of appreciation for commanders on the ground to make their own determinations. This is what I coined in the paper, the forgotten fourth pillar of IHL, the pillar of intelligence analysis and verification. However, in an age of drone warfare and a global war on terror, continuing to ignore the need to establish this pillar and refusing to standardize the law in wartime, on wartime intelligence analysis and verification has immense consequences on human lives. And here comes a case study, and let me take uh, already a kind of disclaimer about this. So I am an Israeli. I worked for the Israeli intelligence for roughly five years. I was working for the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for a while. Um, nonetheless, the commentary I provide here and after is my own and reflects only my own thoughts. I only attempt to conduct a scholarly analysis of a particular issue, an issue that does not focus on Israel at all. Okay, but rather has a broader implications worldwide. There's a tendency with this conflict uh, to be mudded by the occupation, which you've already have heard about, but also to be mudded by political divisiveness. And I'm trying to step away from the political divisiveness surrounding this conflict to only talk about one particular issue, which is the way intelligence is analyzed and verified. And again, it's not special to Israel. So with that said, let me start. Operation Protective Edge took place from July 7th to August 26, 2014. It was yet another round of intense hostilities between Israel and Hamas uh, um, and other various armed groups. The first phase of that operation involved an extended aerial campaign launched by Israel with the purpose of de degrading the military capacity of Hamas and the other organizations in the Gaza Strip, and in particular, halting or significantly reducing the organization's rocket launching. One of the most controversial aerial strikes conducted during Israel's campaign resulted in the death of four children aged 9 to 11 in one of Gaza's beaches. The attack, which occurred on July 16, 2014, immediately sparked international controversy, in part due to the particular beach's close proximity to a hotel housing international journalists. And for that reason alone, if I were there, I would not have said that this attack should happen. Just thinking, but whatever. The Israeli Military Advocate General's Office led an internal investigation of the incident. The, in, the investigation concluded that the children were killed from the Israeli strike. Nonetheless, the MAG ordered on June 11, 2015, that, quote, the investigation file be closed without any further legal proceedings, criminal or disciplinary, to be taken against those involved in the incident. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, who is the Israeli Defense Forces spokesman, but published an official statement summarizing the findings of that investigation, which I wish to read to you in relevant parts. The incident took place in an area that had long been known as a compound belonging to Hamas's naval police and naval commandos, and which was utilized exclusively by militants. Shortly before the incident, an intelligence assessment was established, which indicated that the operatives from Hamas's naval forces would gather in the military compound in order to prepare for military activity against the IDF. On 16 July, aerial surveillance identified a number of figures entering the compound, quote, at a running pace. It should be stressed that the figures were not identified at any point during the incident as children. In light of the above, it was decided to conduct an aerial attack against the figures which had been identified after all the necessary authorizations for the attack had been obtained and after a civilian presence in the area had been ruled out. Tragically, in the wake of the incident, it became clear that the outcome of the attack was the death of the four children who had entered the military compound for reasons that remain unclear. It further arose from the investigation that under the circumstances in question, it would not have been feasible or possible for the operational entities involved to have identified these figures via aerial surveillance as children. 
for the purpose of this analysis, I'm willing to accept everything you've just heard as God's honest truth. If we accept this, what we can learn from this about Israel's position on intelligence is the following. For Israel, the combination of the following three facts, one, that the compound was used in the past by Hamas's navy, two, that an intelligence report anticipated an attack which will be launched from said compound in the foreseeable th future, and three, that aerial surveillance in real time spotted unidentified figures entering said compound at, quote, a running pace, these three fi facts cumulatively constituted sufficient intelligence for launching an attack that comported with Israel's obligations under international law. However, with the benefit of insight, we now know that this attack in actuality involved a series of intelligence faults, all occurring at the assessment and verification stages, beginning with an erroneous intelligence assessment which anticipated a meeting of Hamas naval operatives that never took place, followed by a misguided determination that the compound was vacant of civilian presence both generally and at the time of the operation was authorized, and closing with the problematic identification of four young children as Hamas militants. In my paper, I analyzed at greater length two features I derived from this case study, which are common to faulty intelligence worldwide. One of them is a focus on a single point of data, and another thing is this phenomenon of signature strikes. I don't have time to do this today, but during the Q&A, if you are interested in any of these two topics, I'd be happy to talk to you about them. What I do want to focus about in the remaining couple of minutes I have left is what is important is, is the construction of this fourth pillar of intelligence and what it would do to a case like this. Uh, so, um, the construction of a fourth pillar of intelligence would have profound effects on the legal environment of IHL as it concerns the intelligence function in public world order. As we witnessed from the statements made by the NATO expert committee tribunals and military manuals, they all guide us to rely on this reasonable commander standard, right? Um, the commander should decide what is sufficient intelligence in determining the lawfulness of a particular stock. Yet in the process, we forget that any reasonable military commander will rely on his re reasonable intelligence analyst. The contours of this test are notably underdefined. And this is where I have this kind of... Um, arguably grotesque, arguably uh, a provocative image. In ancient times, warfares, war chiefs who sought the prophecies of Pythias and soothsayers prior to launching their military campaigns needed an interpreter working at the temple to help them understand the moans and the cries of the oracle as she was entering her mantic state. They could not see anything but lure leaves and spring water in the oracle's clay dish. Similarly, modern military commanders often do not know what an effective intelligence gathering operation looks like, or what the process of intelligence verification and, an and analysis entails. Much in the same way that the military chiefs of the old world accepted the prophecies of oracles as the spoken word of God, so do our modern commanders are susceptible, susceptible, not necessarily they do, but they are susceptible of embracing intelligence memorandums and their authors' limited deductive reasoning as a reflection of some form of celestial menticism. Therefore, letting the entire accountability mechanisms of IHL to linchpin solely on the military commander will often result in us missing the behind the scenes as we neglect an important set of actors in the command chain, command chain who seem to get away scot-free and that is intelligence agencies and intelligence experts. Establishing this fourth pillar would redefine the relationship between the military commander and the intelligence analyst. Um, as the law is currently framed, as long as ex ante, the information provided to the military commander made the operation lawful under the laws of war, then an ex post revelation of intelligence omissions will not invalidate the operation's legality. Here lies the accountability gap. It allows states to revert to, quote, a fog of war, accident prong, excuse, whenever their targeting operations result in an unanticipated, at the time, civilian casualties. Introducing the fourth pillar will lead to a normative shift, whereby we will recognize that certain intelligence omissions and faults can be prevented and are not, in fact, inevitable. As such, if those faults, for reasons of, um, sorry, for reasons of recklessness or willful blindness are not prevented before the fact or at least con corrected after the fact, they may become both a wrongful act under the rules of state responsibility and more importantly, a potential war crimes for which members of the intelligence echelon themselves 
might be held liable. And this is so important because so many intelligence agencies currently don't see themselves bound by the Geneva Conventions. It's the only arm of the military that is not necessarily following or uh, required to comply with the rules as they are um, exactly stipulated. This will in turn first states to disclose more of their targeting processes and the intelligence on the basis of which they were launched. Matters that until this point have remained draped with a cloak of secrecy. In a broader context, it will place intelligence agencies within the governance schemes of the Geneva Conventions and the Rome Statute for the first time. This is undoubtedly a revolutionary step but one that follows with the inherent goals of the laws of armed conflict and international criminal law, safeguarding humanitarian interests and ensuring that all branches of the state's military and security apparatus operate within the confines of the rule of law. Thank you very much. I'm much shorter than the other speakers, so I'll just push this down a little bit further. Okay, um, my paper's going to be looking at a particular aspect of ethics in relation to autonomous weapons. I start off with a quote from Kant. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. What does it mean to treat somebody not simply as a means, but as an end? And how does that relate to autonomous weapons? In Kant's conception of a moral theory for eth ethical conduct of individuals and ultimately states to lead to a position of perpetual peace, he derives the principle of humanity. And his understanding of that is, it's a core value for any ethical uh, society or to govern our conduct. The principle of humanity derives from his understanding that there are certain values which can never be overridden, which can never be set aside, because they are intrinsically worthy and much more worthy than any other value. So his distinction is objective ends and relative ends. Objective ends are essentially reasons or justifications for having rules in the first place. So for Kant, the principle of humanity is an objective end. Any moral rule or law that seeks to protect and uphold this objective end should supersede, should override any relative ends. And relative ends are transitory. They are personal desires, they are individual state interests, they are needs, but they are nowhere near objective ends. Why is the objective end deemed to be more valuable? Well, it has an intrinsic value that he refers to as dignity. And it's from there that I want to pick up two strands of human dignity that I find in um, Kant's work. One is understanding human dignity as a status, and the second is understanding human dignity as respectful treatment. And I want to link both of these to autonomous weapon and how autonomous weapons impact on these two strands. So in the conception of uh, humanity, the principle of humanity as a, a status, human dignity as a status, what Kant says is that um, irrespective of our differences, there is a common basic intrinsic value, and that is we have the capacity for rational thinking. That capacity, whether we choose to use it or not, enables us to create norms, abide by norms, or indeed decide to flout those norms. Nevertheless, we have that capacity. In addition to that capacity, we have autonomy of will, which means we're not going to be coerced into following these rules. We're not going to feel oppressed in doing so. There is an automatic feeling of inclination to abide by these rules. <clears throat> 
In the case of autonomous weapons, if we take the status aspect of human dignity, that all individuals have this status of rational capacity and autonomy of will, you have a denial of status to the human target. The human target is not deemed to be worthy of contact with the human combatant. It's a machine that's deciding the ultimate decision to take life or not. And in doing so, it's creating a hierarchy. On the one hand, it's denying the status of the human target to be an individual with the capacity for rational thinking and therefore the possibility to abide by and stick by moral rules. There's no opportunity there to engage. The second way in which a hierarchy is created for human dignity is by taking out a human combatant and replacing them with the autonomous weapon. So the human combatant is um, protected, they face no risk, there is no inherent problem in being in the theatre of operation, they're completely removed from it. Their life is deemed more worthy, the machine comes in and the machine is attacking the human target which is, is deemed to have no worthy status. So that's one way in which autonomous weapons undermine human dignity in terms of uh, status. The other way in which, um, still sticking to the status uh, aspect of human dignity, the other way in which autonomous weapons affect uh, human dignity, if, if we think about it, the, the whole rationale for having human dignity, according to Kant, is this intrinsic value of human beings. Human beings are at the center of the norm creation. Well, if you take out that rational thinking capacity, the ability to create norms that we can all agree to or abide by, what's the point of having rationality then? We're replacing the human capacity to think, to take difficult decisions, exercise judgment, time-specific scenarios in conflict, we're taking all of those, what I refer to as human central thinking activities, out of the equation, and we're actually abdicating those human characteristics to the machine. Again, this is a denial of status of human beings with human dignity. And linked to that is the idea of no face-to-face -face, um, combat. It's been referred to earlier on, and I'd like to pick that up with one of the other speakers. Um, the lack of face-to-face -face killing uh, does also perpetuate this idea of a hierarchy of human dignity. The human combatant is removed, their life is protected, a machine is put in their place, and the human target remains in situ. So by replacing the human combatant with a machine, the combatant's human dignity is not only preserved, but elevated above the human target. This can also be seen as a relative end in Kantian terms, in that it selfishly protects your own combatants from harm at all costs, including violating the fundamental principle of humanity as an objective end. The other aspect of autonomous weapons and their impact on human dignity is creating a cycle of irrationality and irrational agents. And that's pretty much related to removal of human central thinking activities from the theater of operation. If we are talking about fully autonomous weapons who have the capacity to acquire information about a target and the environment, to track the target, to select the target and ultimately decide to attack full spectrum autonomy, where is the human central thinking activity taking place? In the use in Bellow, it's very much woven into the law that there will be the human central thinking activities, proportionality assessment, feasibility of taking precautionary measures. Yet with autonomous weapons, there is no such capacity for human central thinking activities. And incidentally, I, incidentally, I don't think that matter is resolved by um, some advocates saying, oh, there will always be some sort of human control with autonomous weapons. My question is, what sort of human control is that going to be? 
And does it amount to exercising rational thinking, reasoning and judgment? Or are we simply talking about an on-off switch? That, to my mind, is not exercising meaningful human control over the autonomous weapon. Okay, so to move on to the final strand then of human dignity as respectful treatment and how it connects to uh, autonomous weapons. In the Kantian notion, he identifies individuals and others. Respectful treatment is treating yourself respectfully by uh, conducting yourself in a moral way, but also your interaction with others. In relation to autonomous weapons, I think um, the paper goes into some detail about mistreatment of wrongdoers and also preconditions for punishment of wrongdoers, but I'm going to focus on limitations um, of warfare. Methods and means of warfare. Why do we have limitations on methods and means of war warfare, which essentially is where autonomous weapons will fit in? My argument being that they're not desirable. For Kant, Part of the respectful treatment for human dignity relates to this inclusive moral theory. We have those who commit wrongs, we have unjust enemies, we have unjust wars, but it's no good saying they are out with a moral theory or a set of rules. They've got to be dealt with within that theory. Otherwise, there is a danger that you will not know what your enemy is doing, and then there is a parallel system being established which you will have no control over. So, the idea of unjust enemies, unjust causes, wrongdoers, for Kant, has to be dealt with uh, within a morally inclusive theory. What does that mean for autonomous weapons? That there are limitations. Even when the human target has allegedly committed uh, an attack, an atrocity, the response is tempered. And the rationale for tempering that response is, we want to preserve human dignity, even of the human target, the wrongdoer, the enemy, and we want to create conditions that can sustain perpetual peace. My argument is, if you attack the target with the autonomous weapon, it's a relative end, you've removed that individual. But you've no control over the peripheral implications of that, the consequences. If we look at semi-autonomous weapons, the UAVs, unmanned drones, the consequences after a drone attack are very wide and far-reaching. There is evidence of post-traumatic stress disorder on those who witness, those who go in to assist, and also the way in which the target is actually um, removed. It's essentially burning of the body and incineration, which could constitute unnecessary suffering under the use in bellow. So there are wider implications. Simply removing that particular human target does not deal with perhaps the proliferation of alternative tactics, new additional human targets. I don't see autonomous weapons as resolving that. So in Kant's approach to respectful treatment uh, of human dignity, its value in that respect, and linking to autonomous weapons, the rationale for limiting methods and means of warfare, and to my mind excluding autonomous weapons, is to protect the human dignity of the human target, not just the civilians, but also to sustain conditions where it's possible not to perpetuate the war, not to exacerbate the conflict, and perhaps reach a situation of um, settlement, of um, resolution. I'd like to conclude on this point, and that is this. In my paper, I discuss the importance of the interrelatedness and interaction in the law or the rules that govern these particular weapons. What do I mean by that? When I think back to how Kant has conceptualized his moral theory, and this idea that it's inclusive of enemies of wrongdoers, all the time he's trying to sustain an interaction. So on the one hand, um, there may be a wrongdoer. On the other hand, how do you treat the wrongdoer? You certainly don't mistreat them. 
but there will be some form of punishment. That's the interesting bit for me with autonomous weapons. On the one hand, the utilitarian argument is autonomous weapons are good because they will save competent lives, they are efficient, but actually they treat humans as disposable objects, as mere objects, and therein lies the problem. There's no interaction between the combatants and the human targets. There's, there seems to be no interrelatedness. Certainly when you're creating a hierarchy of dignity, there's a cutoff point. That, to my mind, is entirely dangerous. Without any interaction or interrelatedness into the rules that will govern this particular situation, we are in a situation whereby existing rules could be flouted in terms of categories of protected persons, you could have all sorts of methods and means of warfare being put forward as legitimate. And that's a one-sided justification for these types of weapons, which doesn't satisfy the moral requirement. And I'd like to leave it there and perhaps open it up for questions. Thank you very much to all four of you, I thought you have all admirably condensed fairly long and complex papers in roughly a 13, 14 minutes uh, argument. I know that was quite a challenge and you must have all suffered in leaving out a number of additional arguments that you have. But now the chance may be there to add on, to elaborate, but sparked by your questions. We could do it in, had we two hours to go, which I would love to have. We could do it in an ambitious way to start and go paper after paper. But I think uh, in light of the fact that we have roughly 25 minutes left, that would be a bit over ambitious. So I invite you to ask and to address your questions to whomever you like. This will again be a little bit challenging for you because we might shift back and forth, but this is the nice thing about an ESA conference, uh, challenges from all sides. So please um, let me know your questions and I, I, I prefer to go first one by one and perhaps then take a couple of questions together. I see Marco Sassoli, please, Marco. Thank you very much. Uh, I have just a comment on your very forceful presentation, Mrs. Ulgan. Um, I take it that you speak from an ethical point of view and that these are not legal arguments. There are also some legal arguments uh, against and in favor of autonomous weapons. And somehow you are absolutely right, but this is an argument against war, at least war post-medieval, post-samurai kind of war, where one fighter is looking into the eyes of the other fighter and then kills the other fighter, because then there is a possibility, at least, of a moral judgment, but I mean, Already the, uh, La Grosse Bertha, uh, the Germans were bombing Paris from 40 kilometers. Those who were firing La Grosse Bertha were not at all seeing or couldn't have any moral intercourse with those who were killed. And an Exocet missile is sent from hundreds of kilometers, and what counts for IHL is whether the target is a lawful target, and this, and I fully agree with what Altal Lubin said, I said it once, I was only once invited to the, the French military intelligence, and I told them, for IHL, you are more important than any delegate of the International Committee of the Red Cross, because IHL can only work if you work properly. But there again, let's hope that your proposition will uh, be accepted. But once you have this information, then you don't kill people, unfortunately, in war. And this is why we have to stop wars. Uh, 
you don't kill people because they are wrongdoers, and I'm the first one who would agree with you that it would be totally unacceptable if a computer decides who is guilty and who is innocent. But here, uh, as you know, targetability under modern humanitarian law, but Kant would probably criticize this, has nothing to do with uh, responsibility or not. And then comes finally, uh, perhaps you over-idealize human beings who are engaged in war. At least those I experienced, for instance in Bosnia, they were fighting in your ideal situation. They were seeing each other and they were cutting their throats while seeing each other. While here, perhaps my illusion is that someone who programs a machine, because the machine will not, never do kill because it decides to kill, uh, will have more moral judgment about what is legitimate or what is not legitimate than a human being who is in the middle of the battlefield, who hates, who is afraid, and so on. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I agree with what you say. I, I'm not sure the caricature of medieval contact, you know, conflict is what I'm trying to say, really, on this. That's not the importance. The importance is the latter point that you've mentioned. The idea that uh, a final decision can be taken by a machine on life and death. You mentioned the morality of a machine and probably being higher or, or better than a human being. I would dispute that. Um, when you discuss with ethicists and roboticists, they have a very hard time to comprehend the principles that we apply in IHL and this idea of morality in a machine. I explore this to some extent, and I accept there may be an internal logic that the machine acquires. Through the experience of its, of its conduct, it relies on this bank of logical thinking but that's not necessarily morality. Okay, you could program into the machine a set of values, but there is an essence to human thinking, judgment and reasoning, which may be time-specific. You can't program that. It's taking into account a number of factors and then sticking with that decision. The decision may turn out to be wrong, but it's a decision that's been made by a human being on an ultimate decision to take a life. So I, um, I think the caricature of face-to-face -face contact is, is not my, my point here. It's more about the idea, I think you mentioned this, the opportunity of potential remorse or pulling back or surrendering. And I think that's the Kantian notion of humanity. If you're going to take an ultimate life, even of a wrongdoer or in the context of warfare, you've got to be prepared as the human being to take that decision um, and live with it and take the responsibility that comes from it. The danger of simply saying that machines can be programmed to have X, Y, and Z values can perhaps be more logical than human beings in these scenarios is, well, what's the point of us? What's the point of our rationality? What's the point of our human central thinking activities, um, our capacity for forgiveness and remorse. Um, that's, that's the issue we have. Um, and ultimately, it, it just does not satisfy human dignity, in my mind. Thank you for your comments. Let me go to the back. Did I recognize Marco Milanovic there? Marco, please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my questions, I have two questions for Asaf. So, assuming your diagnosis is correct, and I agree with Marcus Sassoli that it probably is correct, what kinds of rules specifically, so, would you devise to make up your fourth pillar? So, what exactly is it that you're proposing? Um, and how would those rules apply to the very diverse body of capability among nations of the world that are engaged in combat and also non-state actors. So the rules you have to devise are rules that Hamas would have to be able to comply with, not just the Israeli intelligence. 
So, and in doing so, would your rules be of sufficient granularity that they would actually um, lead to better outcomes rather than simply having rules of policy that, that should be uh, used by sophisticated militaries? Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for this both these questions. Um, let me just start that within the limits of this presentation, I could not address those, and I'm happy to do this now. Uh, and they, the, the kind of rules I'm thinking about are presented in a paper. Um, let me say three things. One is that uh, we have to distinguish between opportunity strike and um, premeditated strikes. So there's obviously going to be a difference in the sufficient level of intelligence necessary for an operation where a drone, a rocket launcher is being coming out of the ground. We see it. We need to f react right now, as opposed to a three-month premeditated operation like you saw in Eye in the Sky as a movie, right? Um, um, uh, that was ongoing as we went. Um, so that's one kind of general comment at the beginning. The second thing I want to note is that there are general pra best practices that can come together from the discussion that should be done not by me, an academic, but rather by intelligence analysts coming together in Geneva. And I think that part of the issue for me is that I don't feel, as someone who worked from within an intelligence agency, I don't feel like those people who are doing these things are sufficiently, A, being engaged, uh, both being approached or approaching on their own volition um, these types of conversations. So I think that there's a gap that needs to be kind of filled where intelligence analysts are um, joined with the military uh, lawyers who are joined with the military commanders and there's a discussion to be had about these types of rules. But then I can also, this is a cop out, right? So I, I'll also give you some specific rules and I'm gonna say two things and those are the kind of things that I mentioned uh, in brief in my presentation. One is this idea of relying on a single source. So, and I have in the, in, the, in the paper, I look at 10 different cases of intelligence faults that resulted in human casualties. And in many of them, you see a repetition. So they rely, there's a tendency for an intelligence analyst, it's called, based on the Oakham's razor idea, right? There's something so easy with a single source because there's no complexity, there's no conflictions. There's a single source, it's easier for me and many of us as a bias, would rely on a single source of evidence. And it's so important, for example, in the context of the case that I just gave you, to say that if the aerial surveillance is, the technology is not good enough, that you can't tell the height of your target, these were nine to 11 year old children, if you can't tell the height of the target, clearly you can't rely solely on aerial surveillance as your sole basis for launching the operation. You need to corroborate your evidence with another technological source or a, a person on the ground or uh, um, install a camera in the compound or you know, leave it for the intelligence agencies to figure out the means and trust me they will. But the problem is, let, let's first say, you can't rely on a single source. A second example that I mentioned is this idea of signature strikes. I think the, f the reason that I noted this thing that the spokesperson said, running pace, is, is not out of coincidence. There's a thing, you know, there was a quote by a person from the CIA, from the CIA this is back in the, the big days of Al-Qaeda, where uh, someone said anonymously that um, a, a tall, bearded men doing jumping jacks is sufficient basis for launching an attack because we, this is a signature strike. This is a signature of Al-Qaeda training camps. In a similar man manner, this idea of they were running. This is a signature for something. These ideas of sign you know, skipping, jumping, jumping jack, whatever it is, cannot be the sole basis for launching an operation. And Again, I'm not here to be the one solely proposing these. And, I, and what I do in this paper is I look at these intelligence faults to find commonalities, to suggest rules, but this is a first step. And really the person, the people that should be suggesting them are the actual intelligence agencies who are involved in targeted decisions. I'm now, yeah, I'm now slightly escalating the process, taking two questions. First. Yes, my name is Shaq Hartman. I'm from the University of Dundee. Thank you very much for the very provocative presentations. I would like to ask a question to the two first speakers, and that is, is it too easy to apply international humanitarian law? Uh, Helene Heufeld suggested that there might be a third category of law developing. I don't think that's the case. I see it more as if we're applying IHL to more and more cases that would have traditionally been regulated by everyday normal law, law of peace. 
And I think we can see that both in the two presentation from the two first speakers, that there's this tendency to apply IHL to situation that would normally be dealt with under criminal law, such as, for instance, counter-terrorism, or you can regulate an entire territory under the law of occupation. And why would you like to do that? Because it gets you rid of many restrictions that we'd find in the everyday law or, for instance, in human rights law. And you could be tempted to say that to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and to a legal advisor, everything that is possible could be characterized as an armed conflict. We could apply international humanitarian law because then we get rid of many other restrictions. So I'd very much like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. So you have escalated yourself in asking two panelists, so I leave it there and give the panelists the floor. Uh, so if, if I understand the question correctly, uh, it's, uh, I don't know if it, 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 it's a question of what regimes should be applied and to what situations. And I think that, uh, again, if I understand the situation correctly, as a question and, and its context, uh, that in situations, for example, such as Gaza or other situations, to give up the relevance of the law of occupation is too high a price uh, because the specific um, responsibility that come with exercise this kind of control uh, are important and when you continue to exercise control, this kind of control, you have to continue to bear the responsibilities which are as big as your control and not to do that will usually give you lesser responsibilities while still having the power and uh, I uh, uh, just as a reference, again, I says if you want, you can look in the Berkeley Journal of International Law. There's an article I co-wrote with uh, Tamar Feldman on food security, and, and we showed how abandoning the framework of occupation actually allowed for more minimal responsibility. It still stayed with, within IHL because of the uh, belligerency between Israel and Hamas, but allowed to actually say that as long as you don't cause starvation, Purposefully, you are not violating the laws of, of uh, warfare. On the other hand, while your control actually continues to affect uh, food security in Gaza seriously, but you don't have the responsibility of an occupier, uh, that actually creates a gap in the protection, which is why we need the law of occupation in this case. So I don't think it's to apply it in any situation. I don't think it's to apply it when you don't need it. I think it's to apply it when you have a control that requires it. And actually, in a way, you can say, you can critical, and I've heard this criticism of like a more functional approach from other direction, which says it will allow states not to apply the law of occupation in certain situations. And I think that is true. As for the example I gave, or you know, let's take a question of education, for example. So I think, and we'll continue with the example of Gaza. So I think to the extent that the Israeli restriction of freedom of movement affects access of students to, from the Gaza to the West Bank, movement of school materials, of teacher, you have the responsibility of occupier. But to the extent that Israel does not control the curriculum in a school in Gaza, which is run by Hamas, so it does not have the responsibility from the law of occupation to make sure this curriculum is sufficient, etc. So actually you can say it will create places where um, uh, it applies more, but also places where maybe it will apply less because you don't have the power. Uh, so I don't know if I answered your question. I hope I did. And I don't want to enter the discussion about the relationship between human rights law and IHL here because that's a whole different discussion that I've written about. And there's a lot about it in the book, but maybe in the break because I can't take more time. Thank you for your question. Um, so I assume that the question is, or assuming that the counter-terrorism legislation is, that we're seeing is actually applying international humanitarian law to to non-state actors, you could say. Um, and of course, um, this is something I have to think more about, but as I see it right now, I'm thinking that non-international armed conflicts are so little regulated that um, we, there's been this space where states can kind of put in legislation. And, and I suppose you could see that as, as an uh, evolving international humanitarian law, but it just, I think it, it makes it easier to, to think about it by dividing it, uh, by looking at what applies in, in peace and what applies in armed conflict, and suddenly what used to just apply in peace now also applies to armed conflict. And that, of course, happens because there is no regulation of, or 
almost no regulation in non-international armed conflicts. Um, and traditionally that was just something that uh, was uh, dealt with by the state, um, the sovereign state. But, and you may correct me on this, but as I see it, we are in a, in a new situation in the way that I, I, com conflicts don't have borders anymore. Uh, states participate uh, extraterritorially, uh, non-state actors move cross borders, and I think we kind of lack a system that can deal with that. Um, and there, the international humanitarian law is not enough, but then the counter-terrorist legislation tries to, to deal with that, but <laughs> uses that uh, exception that the state is within in a way that's been given to it. Um, but yeah, I have to I have to think more of that because I think it's very complicated to, yeah, with the relationship with the, between the systems that way. As we are unfortunately already slowly drawing to a close, I would like to take three questions which are beautifully concise. And perhaps Madam uh, in the in the center first, and then the two. It's difficult to see. There's at least one gentleman in the back. Yes. And I think, yeah, you were very early, so. Please, Hello, Madam. thank you for giving me the right to ask a question. My name is Sylvia Whitmer. I'm from the Berlin Studies on Jewish Law. Um, my question is directed at Mr. Gross. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. However, I didn't quite understand when you do have a right to occupy because you gave reasons that weren't legitimate and you gave uh, examples how states try to legitimize it, but when can you occupy according to your system that you are establishing? Julian Mortensen from uh, University of Michigan. This question is for Dr. Ulgen. Um, I was curious about your reflections on a comparison between rules of engagement and sort of the underlying programming for autonomous, um, uh, autonomous weaponry. I mean, it seems to me that insofar as both contemplate directions to uh, lethal actors to behave in thus and such a way under thus and such circumstances, they're really, really similar. The one difference that does occur to me is that rules of engagement, um, whether by intent or not, leave the possibility of conscientious disobedience. And so I'm wondering whether or not that is the nub of, um, uh, of your objection to autonomous weaponry as such, especially when you think about the large-scale rules of engagement that replicate that kind of global instruction as to human actors. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kubo Machak. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Exeter. And so, uh, out of interest of fairness, I have two quick questions for the middle two speakers. So we will have uh, answers from all four. So uh, a question for Helen, uh, if I may. Uh, I, if I understood your argument correctly, it seemed to presume that uh, the applicability of IHL from the situation of an extraterritorial non-international armed conflict follows a returning fighter to an outside state. And I was wondering how you justify that from the perspective of a legal basis for this position. When we look at the common article three, uh, it speaks of specifically of the territory of the high contracting party. And even on, under Tadic interpretation, it's still limited to the control of the party within an internal armed conflict. So I was wondering how you justify the legal basis for that position, if I understood it correctly. And then for Asaf, uh, I found it really interesting and uh, very convincing argumentation for a fourth pillar. But when you, uh, when you listed the three first ones, my thinking was, well, the fourth pillar under IHL is simply precautions in attack. And that is a pillar that we have codified in uh, additional protocol one in article 57. And so I was wondering to what extent your argument can be fitted under the requirement to do everything feasible to verify that the objectives to be attacked are indeed military objectives that we do find in additional protocol one and that it's simply the interpretation of what is everything feasible that might be changing with the evolving times and as our military intelligence acquires more capabilities, this capacity grows as well. Thank you. Thank you to the audience to 
give all four speakers the possibility for a last word. And may I, in light of the time, very kindly and politely ask you to give answers that mirror the questions in their beauty of conciseness. Please. I, I just want to, uh, quickly to say I totally agree with you. And I think precautionary measures is something that we often overlook. And we have to remember, even before we talk about the proportionality, and after we talk about distinction, to talk about them. And often it is missing in the distinction, and uh, I'm very disturbed by that. So thank you for making this point. I don't think there is a right to occupy, but I think that occupation is not illegal if it doesn't violate those three principles. So if you occupy a territory without trying to actually gain sovereignty, and you manage it as a form of trust for the benefit of the local population, and on the principle of its temporary and not taking steps that won't indicate that it should be permanent or indefinite, then the occupation is not illegal per se, um, and it is illegal if it violates those principles. That's very simple. So if you will occupy a territory because of a situation of armed conflict, and indeed you will control it, realizing you gained the temporary control, and it doesn't become yours, you're not supposed to uh, violate those principles, and you know, it, that would also presumably lead to ending the occupation within you know, relatively quick time with the hand of the hostilities, then you will not violate those principles and you will be a legal occupier, but not an illegal occupier. But I don't call it a right to occupy. I don't think there is a right, such a right. I never found it in the Universal Declaration or in the rights of states to occupy other states. Thank you. Right, thank you for your question. Um, as I see it, as I read Common Article 3, uh, it applies to all the parties to the conflict. That includes also uh, non-state act actors. Um, so the territory of the non-state actor. And it is meant to protect those who are affected by the conflict. Battlefield, as you uh, can use that, is not a legal term, but a descriptive term. It's something that you use after uh, the war has ended. And so, as I see it with these conflicts we have today, um, it makes only sense that um, a conflict is not dependent on the local level of violence, but um, on who is affected by the hostilities. Common Article 3 protect those who are affected. Um, so, and in, in contrast to applying it in a third state, it's here p based on the parties and not the person's movement. Um, yeah. Thanks. Well, so, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I will concede immediately that currently the way uh, the current law on intelligence in IHL is framed is solely framed within this box of everything feasible. That's where it is. That's where it stands right now. And this leads me to argue that currently it's nothing more than a, su a supporting beam, not a pillar, in the sense that it's here to support distinction, to support proportionality, to support um, pr uh, precautions. But, and this is really the core of this argument, is that leaving it to be just this supporting thing is exactly the root of the problem. By recognizing it as an issue, a fundamental core topic of IHL, what you will be doing is you'll be introducing ICL obligations, state responsibility obligations. Um, you'll be developing a discourse surrounding what intelligence agencies are to be expected to do as part of their military operations. And again, I, and this, I, my, my, my knowledge is limited, okay? I only know what I've seen and I only know what I've, from the people I've spoken to. But in multiple jurisdictions, I can say that many intelligence analysts who have been involved in targeting operations do not consider themselves to be sufficiently engaged with this body of rules. And that is a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, if I'm honest, I suppose I haven't thought about it in terms of conscientious uh, disobedience. But what I would add is this. Um, the rules of engagement that exist at the moment uh, with the introduction of autonomous weapons, if they um, do come about, my concern is the dilution of human involvement, the blurring of lines of responsibility, 
and ultimately abdication of that responsibility. Um, there is, this is another part of my research which I haven't mentioned in the paper, but there is a strong connection between distance and disengagement, moral disengagement. There's a lot of empirical uh, evidence on the First World War, Second World War and the Vietnam War in terms of aerial combat, um, the consequences of being close to the theatre of operation or being further from it. And what the evidence shows is, um, if the further away you are, whether you're seeing what you're doing or not, but just being further from the theatre of operation, creates less of a feeling of guilt or indeed moral uh, attachment to what is going on. With autonomous weapons, complete removal of human beings, if we're saying the full spectrum of autonomy is within the weapon, then to my mind, uh, there is complete removal of that uh, accountability, ultimately responsibility. The military may say that there will always be human control with these weapons. Well, my answer to that would be, my question would be, what sort of human control? The key aspects of targeting, the legitimate targeting, the proportionality assessment and unnecessary suffering has to be done by a human being, that ultimate decision to attack. It's not going to be done by an on-off switch. So um, these, are my, these are my thoughts on your um, interesting point there. And the, the line really here is a concern about anonymity in, in killing. And, and that goes back to the empirical evidence. The, the greater distance there is from the theater of operation, the more opportunity there is to feel disengaged and the more opportunity there is to use any methods and means of warfare. Thank you for your question. It is painful to end this debate at such an early, perhaps even embryonic state, but I, I'm afraid we have to. Uh, I thank all of you very, very much for fascinating presentations. And um, I think the audience uh, has not disappointed at all our expectations. I told you it would be a, a lively debate and I could somehow see even though not clearly from here, that many questions could not have asked. I regret uh, this very much, but I thank you very much for having uh, come to this panel and to have uh, engaged so constructively. Have a, have a good afternoon. <laughs>